Oh, right, okay. That's why I've not been getting away with it. Hiya, how y'all doing? Hope you're coping well in isolation. I've been great, thanks for asking. I uh, did want to catch up with some video editing and finally finish off those Fire Festival videos. Unfortunately, my computer's had a different idea. It's instead died. So I've been stuck using my notebook, which uh, is quite inadequate for everything I would need to do for video editing, especially the audio quality and video quality as well. So no more Fire Festival videos for a while. Instead, what I thought I'd do is start up doing a bunch of little shorter videos which would each look at a certain thing within the field of psychology, like uh, people, theories, experiments, and talk about why they're significant and why they're still taught today. So, first episode, particularly Metal Case, um, this is the book Patient HM. It's not about the, um, the subject of today's video, but I will get to Patient HM at some point. Chapter 9 begins with a description of the contents of the Francis A. Countway Library of Medicine on the campus of Harvard Medical School in downtown Boston. And in a bunch of glass-fronted cabinets and jars, there are medical curiosities, like uh, bits of old bodies in formaldehyde and... Uh, uh. Ooh, God, I don't even know what that is. Um, anyway, but uh, after a brief description, it continues. All but one of these relics are from anonymous individuals. The exception is so famous that even just a glimpse of his skull might bring his name to your lips. That name is Phineas P. Gage. Phineas P. Gage was born in 1823, and not that much is known about his life before the accident, which would see his name still being spoken nearly 200 years later. He wasn't highly educated, but he was literate, and he was said to be a strong and active man, a great favourite of the men who worked for him, the most efficient and capable foreman, according to his contractors, and a shrewd, smart businessman who possessed a well-balanced mind. At the age of 25, he was the foreman of a group of men working railway construction in Vermont, and their work involved boring holes into large rocks, filling them with explosive powder, and then tamping the powder down with an iron rod, uh, a bit like how muskets and old pistols used to be loaded. Following that, sand would be poured into the hole, and that would be tamped again, and then the fuse would be lit. Oh, on the 13th of September, 1848, Gage was tamping down some gunpowder when an accident occurred. A spark set off the powder while Gage still had his tamping rod in the hole in the rock. The explosion sent the 1.1 metre long iron rod flying. It shot upwards through Phineas's skull, knocked him off his feet and landed about 20 metres away, covered in blood and bits of his brain. Okay, so from here to about here is what 1.1 metres looks like. This is the length of the iron rod which went flying through Phineas Gage's head. Although obviously this is just my crutch and as such it's not going flying through anyone's head because I'm not going to be using it for tamping down dynamite anytime soon. Although you could technically, it's long enough and it's even got a rubber tip on the end so it's safer. It's also not been specially made for me though, it's just a regular crutch whereas Phineas Gage had actually specially commissioned the making of that iron rod that he was using at the time. Uh, they called them crowbars. Uh, even though we we would call something different a crowbar. See, unlike our crowbars, it didn't have this bend here and it also didn't have uh, the claw at one end and it even was lacking the little wedge at the other end. Um, instead, it was tapered into a point. It was more like a javelin, well, half a javelin because javelin's thicker in the middle and it tapers the points at either end. So, yeah, it was like if you cut a javelin in half, that was what, they meant when they said crowbar. So when you would read contemporary reports of the case, they called it the American crowbar case. And even the doctors who treated him refer to it as a crowbar. It's quite annoying from a 20th, 21st century perspective because obviously language changes over time. And when we think of crowbar, this is what we have going through our heads. Whereas really what we should have going through our heads is half an iron javelin, much like Phineas Cage did. <laughs> I'm going to hell. The entry point left a hole in the base of his cranium which had a diameter of about half that of the tamping rod and a hairline fracture running down the front of his skull from the exit wound indicated that his skull had hinged open as the rod passed through it before being pulled closed again by the, the sheer strength and tenacity of the soft tissue underneath. Incredibly, it, Gage soon regained consciousness 
and he was helped by his friends, by by his workers, um, to an ox cart to be taken back to his lodgings in the town's hotel, which is a journey of about three quarters of a mile, that Gage was conscious and sat upright for. He even talked to the guy driving the carriage. After alighting from the carriage and making his way up to his room, he soon met by the physician Edward H. Williams, who he greeted with the now infamous and somewhat laconic statement, Doctor, here is business enough for you. Gage was treated by Williams and Dr. John Martin Harlow, who turned up about an hour later. Um, Harlow himself gives four reasons why he believes Gage survived. The shape of the tamping iron, its point of entry, which allowed the infection to be drained much easier, uh, the physique, will and capacity for endurance of Gage, and the area of the brain the tamping iron obliterated, which we'll get to shortly. Um, it also has to be mentioned, though, that Harlow's doing himself, and to be fair, Williams as well, massive disservice here and doubtless a significant contribution to Gage's survival with the medical decisions Harlow made while treating him. Don't want to go into too much detail about the procedures they use because it's it's medical rather than psychological, so it's not really relevant, but um, still it's worth mentioning that in 1848, they treated a man who had a hole blown in his head and was missing parts of his brain, and that man went to live another 12 years. And that's seriously impressive for the medical knowledge and technology that they had at the time. They were really the first to show the world that massive head trauma isn't always fatal. And that's an act which deserves a recognition and is a legacy that deserves respect. Good work, Williams and Harlow. You guys are all right. Respect. Anyway, back to your patient. This isn't an exact replica of Phineas's skull, although it does have holes in it. <laughs> um, granted, these are for fish to swim through, but still. Um, the rod, the tamping one, not the fishing one, entered Phineas's head around about here and it exited around about here. Obviously, this isn't to scale. Uh, in between these two points is an area of the brain known as the frontal lobes, of which you have two, one on your left and one on your right, naturally. Phineas Gage's left was quite a bit knackered by the rod going through, but his right was more or less intact. Um, this is also home to a bit of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Now, this we now know is closely involved in working memory. It encodes a lot of data that your brain receives and handles and processes. And it's also responsible for your behavioral responses, how you plan and um, consider consequences of your actions. So it's very much involved in your personality. It's involved in how you express yourself, your desires, your beliefs, your opinions. And as such, damage to it can radically change a person's personality. If only they knew that 200 years ago. If only they had MRIs and things. <sighs> right, now, the problems that we have in determining the extent of the damage the accident caused is that not only was no autopsy conducted after Gage had died, Harlow laments this in the 1868 report, I think, uh, and that he undoubtedly suffered more damage through uh, infection of surrounding tissue, hemorrhage, the excision of protruding matter, you know, just generally like the bits that they cut off and the other things that they did. At one point, Harlow mentions poking his finger through the hole, and I'm pretty sure that wasn't sanitary. But he also lived in a time when it wasn't even known that damage to one side of the brain affects the opposite side of the body. You know how, you know, left side of your brain controls the right side of your brain. They didn't know that at the time. The phrenology was still a thing. Gage is described as, by Harlow as being nervobilious in character. Uh, that's, um, that's a phrenological term. And so Gage's case would posthumously be used to help disprove phrenology thanks to Harlow's 1868 report, which detailed the changes to Gage's personality following the accident. Uh, ironically, Harlow believed in phrenology, so the idea of personality change occurring after damage to the brain was a little bit more palatable for him to accept than it was for most of his contemporaries. Uh, at the time, dominant thinking was either phrenology or it was that the brain was just another organ and it didn't really do anything. And so both of those views just starting to be challenged. And, and I mean really just starting to be challenged. It, 
1861, just seven years previously, Paul Broca had discovered that language processing is localized in a specific area of the brain. We now call that area of the brain Broca's area, but that's another video for another time. Um, in 1873, David Ferrier's experiments with monkeys provide evidence for cerebral localization. And in 1879, Wilhelm Wundt would open the first laboratory specifically dedicated to psychological research. So we are literally talking about the birth of psychology here. And Phineas Gage is right there at the beginning. So what happened to Gage afterwards? Well, we can't really talk about that without a disclaimer. There are four primary sources we have for information about Phineas Gage. There's two reports from Harlow uh, in 1848 and 1868. Uh, a report from Henry J. Bigelow in 1850. Uh, he's the professor of surgery at Harvard who'd examined Gage just over a year after the accident. And there are some notes from Dr. J.B.S. Jackson, who was the then curator of the Warren Anatomical Museum, who'd spoken to Gage's family and uh, other people who knew him. Between these three people is everything we know about the personality changes that Gage experienced. But later writers have embellished the story somewhat, and many accounts of the misfortunes which befell Phineas contain exaggerations, distortions, and outright lies. So to that end, I'm going to give the next paragraph over to Harlow's description from his 1868 report. All right, so this, this quote's quite long, so forgive me for not memorising all of this. I'm just going to read it and... I'll try to make it interesting visually in post. <laughs> post. They were going to sort that out in the dub. His contractors, who regarded him as the most efficient and capable foreman in their employ previous to his injury, considered the change in his mind so marked that they could not give him his place again. The equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. A child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. Previous to his injury, though untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as a shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. So what Gage actually did during the remainder of his life is at odds with many of the portrayals of him that would come in later decades. He has been depicted as unreliable, prone to violence, impulsive, alcoholic, a drifter who indulged his sexual urges and eventually died penniless. But none of this is true. After initially being exhibited by Barnum's American Museum in New York and giving some lectures, Gage worked as a coach driver in New Hampshire for a year and a half before he moved to Chile to help set up a stagecoach line there. Now, a stagecoach driver is a very controlled and regimented job, which required both adherence to a strict routine and the ability to pay attention to the road for extended periods of time. He spent nearly eight years there before returning home in 1859 after a short illness and following a brief spell of recovery where he began working on some nearby farms because he was a little restless of being cooped up indoors all day. And you know what? I'm pretty sure we can all empathise with that right now. Unfortunately, about that time, he started to experience seizures and they would only worsen and eventually they led to his death on the 21st of May, 1860, which is 11 and a half years after the accident. In his 1868 report, Harlow comments, This case has been cited as one of complete recovery, it being often said that a very considerable portion of the left cerebrum was lost without any impairment in the intellect. Mentally, the recovery certainly was only partial, his intellectual faculties being decidedly impaired, but not totally lost. Nothing like dementia, but they were enfeebled in their manifestations, his mental operations being perfect in kind, but not in degree or quantity. This may perhaps be satisfactorily accounted for in the fact that while the anterior and a part of the middle lobes of the left cerebrum must have been destroyed as to function, its function suspended, its fellow was left intact and conducted its operations singly and feebly. Now, our modern understanding of the brain shows that it's surprisingly elastic, not in a literal sense, obviously, but rather that it's capable of rewiring itself to an extent and compensating for trauma in order to keep functioning. It's it's not going to be 100% ever again, it's, but it's preferable to, you know, dying. <laughs> We also know a lot more about what areas of the brain affected by Gage's accident do, and more importantly, how injuries to those areas can manifest. To quote Adrian Rain in The Anatomy of Violence, 
Thanks, Adam. A large body of evidence has now convincingly shown that adults suffering head injuries that damage the prefrontal cortex do indeed show disinhibited, impulsive, antisocial behaviour. We also know that one of the most effective treatments for people who've experienced injuries in similar areas of the brain are regular activities which involve structure and routine, uh, rehabilitation through relearning lost physical and social skills. From what we know about what's involved in being a stagecoach driver around the time, it's possible, though obviously we can't say for certain, but it's possible that this regimented profession helped temper the extremes of the behavioural changes Gage experienced. It may even have contributed to his long-term recovery in much the same way as therapy helps people recover from brain trauma nowadays. The tragic history of the field of psychology is that until medical technology advanced far enough to let you know what was going on inside somebody's head without having to cut the top off it first, is that until then, the only real way to see what was going on inside somebody's head was to cut the top off it first. Typically, you had to wait for someone to die. And when people experienced traumatic injuries like what Gage went through, they usually did. In fact, Harlow himself says that he couldn't find another case in the literature at the time of somebody who experienced something similar. So it's not just that reason that Gage is still being taught today though. I mean, yeah, he was really the first to survive something like that, but he also helped push our understanding of the brain and its functions in, in completely different ways. He challenged the dominant zeitgeist at the time, not personally, but his case did. People were either phrenologists or they were people who just thought the brain was another organ. And Gage was the first to indicate that, no, there's, there's more to the brain than this. There's it does things. It's it's involved with us and our personalities and who we are. It pushed science in a completely new direction. And like I said at the start of the birth of psychology, Gage is right there. Gage is just 20 years, 21 years away from the first psychology department ever being opened. There's really no other way around it. He's instrumental in the development of the field and for that reason that's why we still talk about him is there a cold one left In Harlow's 1848 report, Harlow mentions that an abscess has formed under Gage's frontalis muscle. Um, these are muscles on your forehead, one on your left, one on your right, and they make a sort of M shape like that. Uh, he says that on the 27th of September, two weeks after the accident, he drained it of about 240 millilitres. Thought you all might like to see what 240 millilitres looks like. Just imagine... Carrying all that, sloshing about underneath your forehead. Cheers. <laughs>